Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today it's with great pleasure, and you will understand later why, that my guest today is a senior lecturer at Bezalel uh, in Jerusalem, which is the Academy of Arts, Noah Heisler Rubin. Noah is a cultural geographer and a town planner, but more importantly, she's working on Jerusalem in the period of the Early, 19th, uh, early 20th century, particularly focusing on the work of the British planners in the like of Patrick Geddes and uh, Charles Asby. And as I said earlier, it's a pleasure for me because I uh, learned a lot from her work, which certainly influenced my own. So we're going to certainly talk about the question of, of uh, uh, basically early British Jerusalem in the early 20th century, but also we're going to talk about uh, questions of archives and digital heritage. As uh, uh, Dr. Rubin recently organized a beautiful conference, which hopefully one day will be available online, on the question of heritage and archives in Jerusalem and of Jerusalem. But first of all, Noah, welcome. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you for this lovely introduction. I'm very happy to be with you. First question I want to ask, because you're in Jerusalem and you work on Jerusalem, is now, what is your Jerusalem? What is your connection with the city? Oh, actually, it's a very simple question. I, I was born in Jerusalem and I've lived here most of my life and I still live here. Um, and I got to know some parts of it quite well. And the older I grew, the more I realized that the neighborhoods I've been living here represent different periods in the development of Jerusalem. And when I started studying geography and history, I started understanding the context of the development of the neighborhoods and their planning and building. Um, and I got very much interested in that. So basically my life and my work mesh in, in many aspects. Of course, I raised my kids here. So I have a lot of you know, issues concerning what kind of uh, quality of life do we um, supply the people of Jerusalem, whether it's my kids or my neighbor's kids. I live on, on I live in Baca, which is a, a neighborhood very close to the former Green Line. So I have a lot of neighbors from the other side of Jerusalem. And, and these are questions which occupy me on a daily basis, both at work and at home. I want to take advantage to ask you also something about uh, Bet Salel, because this is like a very important institution in Jerusalem one which I didn't have yet the time nor the opportunity to uh, unpack with uh, others. Uh, so I was wondering if you can give us a sense of uh, what is the Ac Academy of Arts? What is Bezalel uh, in Jerusalem and for Jerusalem? Oh, that's a great question. Well, Bezalel was founded in the beginning of the 20th century, just a few years before the British arrived uh, by Boris Schatz, whose main idea was to create an institute for Jewish art. Now, we don't really know what he meant by Jewish art, but it was very interesting to see what he considered to be Jewish art. Um, for example, I might be jumping ahead here, but when Patrick Geddes arrived in Jerusalem, he said there's no such thing as Jewish architecture. So what is Jewish art? How is it different from any other art? And the Jews who were living in Jerusalem at the time were either locals or migrants from various places in the world. So they brought different traditions and different cultural aspects into their artistic work. Uh, but that was the idea. So it evolved around Jewish themes like Jewish holidays in art. Uh, and eventually it, it, it incorporated Jewish or Israeli or Palestinian scenes of, of local nature, which became embedded into local Jewish art. So that's the beginning. It is a fascinating, um, I mean, idea indeed, and certainly Beth Salel then played a major role in the development of uh, uh, sort of arts and design, particularly for, for the Zionist project. And you already mentioned, and we certainly we're going to talk about uh, individuals like Patrick Geddes and Charles Asby. 
Uh, and so, you know, given the fact that most of your publications effectively are dealing with uh, urban planning, Patrick Geddes, Charles Asby, uh, and we're going to talk about them. But I want to ask you, how did you become an urban planner or, uh, mm. as it says, the website also an urban geographer? And how does it feel to, you know, be uh, involved in these kind of disciplines, being in Jerusalem? Mm. Um, well, frankly, I think I became an urban planner because of my father, uh, who didn't grow up in Jerusalem, and he was fascinated by the city. And every Saturday, we would go on a long walk, and he would, the, his motto was, uh, let's go see what's new. Let's see what's new in the city. And we would roam around the city and, and look for interesting places. I don't know how much my father really knew about the history of the city, uh, but he knew quite a lot. And as I mentioned before, we lived in different places. Um, I grew up in various neighborhoods in Jerusalem. I lived for 10 years in the Jewish quarter when it was just repopulated with, with Jews. So it was fascinating for me. It was, you know, a Saturday stroll with my father, but eventually I realized that there is a lot going on and there's a lot new, even in Jerusalem all the time. And, you know, just getting to know the people and their habits around the city and new buildings and old buildings and learning a little bit about the history and their background. Um, I think that's how I became interested. Um, and, and another, great person that I have, that I owe a lot to is Yoshua ben who wrote the historical geography of Jerusalem in modern times. And I happened to take, um, uh, to take some courses, you know, between that period of being a soldier and then going into the university, I just took some courses about Jerusalem. And, and, and I was fascinated and I asked myself, who, who might have written about this? Where can I study more? And someone just said, you have to read Yoshua ben And he happened to be teaching at the Department of Geography at the Hebrew University. And that's how I became an urban geographer. I just wanted to learn more about the city and that was the place to do it. I believe that regardless of the politics and ideas, I mean, those two books, volume one and two of the old city and the new yeah. city are, are still like a milestone. I mean, anybody working on Jerusalem, yeah. particularly sort of the late Ottoman moving, you know, around into the 20th century. I mean, th these are like, you know, essential readings, essentially, yeah. uh, something that, uh, you need, you need to be familiar with the details, the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, material that is available. I mean, my work too was basically uh, influenced by that and started probably, you know, reading those books, like uh, trying to figure out exactly, you know, what were the changes that occurred later on. And talking about changes, I really want to start, you know, delving into your work. Um, so as we know, you know, as a result of World War I, by the winter of 1917, going into 1919, the British took over and conquered Jerusalem, and later on the rest of Palestine. And, you know, later on, obviously, they established a mandate. But more importantly, they began to work on thinking about uh, how to redesign Jerusalem. And here we have, obviously, the creation uh, of the first of the pro-Jerusalem society by Ronald Storrs. But more importantly, the employment of urban planners. Padre Geddes and Charles Asby. And so I was wondering if you can take us through, you know, whether Padre Geddes first and then Charles Asby later, but tell us a little bit more about who are these individuals and how they worked and the, how they thought the city should have been under the British. Um, well, it is a fascinating story. And, and, and I know, you know, it's being, it's being told by different people from various perspectives. Um, and, and I, you know, I keep thinking, what, what is, what is my perspective? Why am I so interested in these guys? And I think I got to be interested in them from the perspective of, of the planning. Um, I, I later arrived at studying their work in Jerusalem, but I was a very keen student of, of urban design and urban planning. And I was fascinated with the actual beginnings, with the beginnings of planning, um, back in Britain and, uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, I was just fascinated with that, with the various ideas and theories and disciplines that went into town planning. And when I was looking into my, um, into my master's, when I was uh, trying to figure out what is, it is that I want to concentrate it on, uh, I will mention another important man in my academic career. That's, of course, Professor Ron Bloom. And he said, well, that's fine. British is great. Planning is wonderful. But why 
why not look here? Why not study what, uh, what they did back here? Just, you know, under your nose, they say in Hebrew. Here, study planning as it, um, as it came into being in Jerusalem. And that's how I got interested in the actual becoming of Jerusalem, a planned city. And, and the, era, the time that you described, this beginning of the British mandate area, just, era, just after the First World War, that was the beginning of modern town planning here in Jerusalem. And, and that's how I started, you know, studying on, 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 a, on a daily basis, how one of those brought here planners to plan Jerusalem. So I went back to his memoirs and, and tried to figure out what was important for him when he came to Jerusalem. So obviously he wanted to bring water into the city and he wanted to bring food. And, and, and literally next in line was planning the city or conserving the city or taking care of, of its built environment, not so much of the people, mostly of the built environment. And, and very quickly he invited, he started inviting world known planners. Um, and Charles Robert Ashby and Gettys, they weren't the first, you know, there was William McLean, um, who is important in this story, not so much um, of his, because of his effect on Jerusalem, but because of his lineage as a planner. He was a very uh, primal planner. He was, he was an engineer. And that, that's how planning started. That's one of the threads that became modern urban planning. And he came here from Khartoum in Sudan and he designed, we, we all know the plan by McLean for the city. It was a grid, a very basic grid. Of course, it concentrated on the old city of Jerusalem. And, and it was really the first time that a planner said, the old city is the most important place in the city and everything should concentrate around it. And of course, that's his most important legacy to the planning of the city. But the rest of the plan was like, you know, they said it's like planning Chicago here in Palestine. Um, it's, it's no different than any other plan that we could suggest for any other city in the world. But that was the beginning of planning. They were trying, they were trying it out. They were trying different paradigms, different plans. And obviously that plan did not suit Jerusalem, at least not according to stores and the rest of the British were already here. And, and very quickly within three or four months, they said, let's bring Ashby. And, and that was the beginning of another planning story in Jerusalem because Ashby was the complete opposite of McLean. He was the complete opposite of, of, a, of, um, of an engineer. McLean wanted straight streets and, and urban logic and, 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 a, and a basic grid which allowed orientation and, and control over the city. And Ashby was an artist, he was an architect, he was, a, he was an arts and crafts um, um, artist and, and his motivation for planning was completely different. And Stolz mentions it in his memoirs, I want Ashby because he is from arts and crafts. He knows how to conserve a city. He knows how to conserve the goods, the good things of the city. And it's obvious that they are talking about the same thing. What are the good things of the city? What, the, what are the amenities of the city? So obviously they were really want, wanting the, the, the same thing. So when Ashby arrived here in 1918, um, their collaboration was wonderful from the very beginning, or so it seems they wanted the same thing. They wanted to conserve the old city. They wanted to conserve traditions. They wanted to conserve um, old architecture, which of course was mainly medieval. That's what they kept, kept going back to both stores and Ashby. Um, they wanted to study the city for its own merits. They wanted to preserve the traditions of the city, which came about in preserving not only the buildings, but also local arts like um, glass blowing and uh, Armenian pottery, which is of course a story of, on its own. Um, so so that, was, um, that was Ashby's say on planning. And, and of course, it wasn't only Ashby who was planning in the arts and crafts tradition, but Jerusalem was the main place where he could carry out his ideal because obviously people were planning garden cities, not arts and crafts cities. Uh, and then Ken Geddes, and, and Geddes was the third in, in this lineage of planners. I know he's always mentioned second because the second plan is, is um, is, is accredited to him, but he actually arrived here almost two years after Ashby was already working in Jerusalem. And obviously they had similar sentiments. And, and, and of course we know that they came up with similar plans, they cooperated, they produced a joint plan. Um, but Geddes was once again, a different planner. He came from a different tradition. He was a sociologist, a biologist. He wanted to study the evolution of, of the people and the place. So he arrived at similar conclusions as Ashby did regarding the city and its development, 
but he came from, he presented, a, he represents a different strand of planning, something which has to do with the evolution of the people and the place and how to look back to the, for, to the origins of the city and plan it accordingly. And of course, we all cherish his legacy for asking the people, like we, we call it in planning today, uh, public participation in planning. We say Geddes was the first planner who actually tended to the needs of the people, who actually minded their needs, their aspirations, their urban logic. Now, of course, he didn't do exactly that, but in a way he was really interested in the people's lives and the way they can be improved through town planning. They were also very different individuals. I mean, certainly in terms mm. of like personal life, you know, if we consider Charles Aspi, I'm not sure is the right word, but certainly he had a more flamboyant kind of life. Certainly mm. uh, fascinating. Um, well, Geddes looks like sort of a more, uh, shall we say, regular individual. I was curious about one term that you used, and uh, that's very common when we look at, uh, again, the early 20th century, uh, upon the arrival of the British, individuals like Rona Stores and Ashby, they really understood Jerusalem in terms of preservation. And I was wondering, you know, from an urban planning perspective, what is that they really want to preserve? I mean, how did that kind of urban planning uh, impact the city? Um, well, uh, you know, we all we all talk about that now. Uh, what 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 was it that they wanted to preserve, or you know, we could say, what is the image of Jerusalem that was so important for them? Uh, and it, you know, the answer seems today obvious. But what what is this image made of? What was it that they envisioned as the important parts of the city? What was it that they cherished so much? And and it's funny because eventually, Geddes and Ashby sanctified similar elements of the city and cherished the same elements, but they did it for different reasons. Um, for Ashby, it was the medieval city because he was, you know, as an art and crafts artist, he wanted to look for that, um, that ideal period when people and their practice were one, when the work represented the lives of the worker. And he found that as many of his contemporaries did in, in medieval times in Jerusalem, in its architecture and its in crafts symbolized for him the best examples of local Middle Eastern medieval arts, which of course are um, constructions. Uh, but that's what he looked for. He looked for um, architecture that represented that period, which of course today we know is mostly Mamluk. Um, and, and that's the period that he cherished most. And of course he also embedded, incorporated in that uh, Ottoman buildings, such as the, the the walls around the old city, which were considered um, something that uh, completed this image of the city. Um, and so he looked for local medieval Muslim art. Um, of course, these are all uh, very words which must be unpacked, but those are the terms that we used at the time. It's like a, a medieval Muslim city. Whereas Geddes was much more interested in the Jewish past, past of the city. Um, Geddes really wanted to resurrect the Jewish nation on its land. And of course, Jerusalem was the, the highlight. And he wanted to uncover the Jewish roots of the city, the city of David and Solomon, just like Storrs did. And he kept looking for the Jewish origins of the city. And it's funny that eventually they both came up with, with similar elements, which they regarded as most important. The vision of the city eventually became one, whether it was the medieval city or the older city. Of course, there wasn't much left of David and Solomon's city in 1918, which they, they, they really tried to envision, but they were looking for different pasts in, in the present of the city. Um, but they, they both came up with, with similar elements, which is, which is something interesting. And, and that was part of my eventual criticism about their work, that they were looking for something they imagined and they lost a lot in the way. Um, for example, the way that Ashby planned a, a stadium just next to the old, uh, to, 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 the, to the Western Wall, 
because he envisioned that that's how people lived in Jerusalem back in those cherished times. And obviously that would be a place, a good place for sports. So he completely lost touch with current Jerusalem and planned a stadium in, in one of the most um, complex places in the city. And Geddes did almost the same. Geddes was the first one who said, we have to clear a plaza next to the Western Wall. We have to allow the Jews clear access to their most important place. And of course there was, we know, we know very well that there was already a neighborhood built there from the 15th or 16th century, once again, a Mamluk Ottoman neighborhood. Um, and, it, and, and he completely missed out on, on the fragility of that area, on, on the fragile politics of that area. And, and for years he kept writing letters to, to the Zionist commission, to the, to the local British governor saying, this is the way about. This is what we have to do in order to allow Jews access, in order to improve the city. He wanted to improve it, but he completely missed out on, on, on the complicated actual politics of the time. So we say preservation, but obviously uh, he didn't want to preserve everything. And of course, the best example is, is the Turkish clock tower or, or in, in total, the clearing of the walls. If you want to preserve, you have to choose what to preserve. And obviously their selection uh, was, was, was very problematic because they selected what they wanted to preserve. They didn't want to preserve the city intact. They didn't want to preserve the city as they found it in, in 1918. They wanted to preserve different elements, which for them was the image of the proper Jerusalem, of the right Jerusalem. That made me think to a question of the late Ottoman planning, uh, particularly the question of modernity. Uh, the Ottomans had been involved in some form of planning, might have been coherent or not. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of debates about it. Um, certainly, Jamal Pasha, even during the war, invested some time and efforts to rethink the city, uh, thinking about uh, gardens around the municipality, certainly the clock tower coming before. Uh, there were ideas about a tram line, which eventually materialized a century later under completely different circumstances. But it, it feels like the Ottomans were envision in Jerusalem as an imperial city, which should have been modernized, not necessarily connected to a religious vision, a biblical one. But here you have individuals like Ronald Storrs and uh, Ashby, to an extent, Geddes, that actually they're thinking about something different, like keeping the city uh, as it was, or as it should have been in their own ideas. And I was wondering if in your work, uh, you came up, you came across this tension, and how did they justify th this uh, idea of holding the city from modernizing? Mm. Um, um, great. Well, first of all, this is this is a question of historiography because obviously now we know that there was a lot of modern modernization going on in in, in Ottoman Jerusalem. Of course, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. Of course, when uh, when when Yoshua Benayer wrote his his magnificent volumes, we we believed that modernization came with the British, or at least the Jewish Zionists. There was no modernization. There was no local modernization. You know, um, Ottoman Jerusalem was part of the dying, disseminating Ottoman uh, Empire, and and nothing good was happening in Jerusalem. So thankfully, eventually, we opened our eyes to see the local modernization, the local Ottoman modernization. And, we, and, and today we realize that the clock tower was nothing but traditional. It, it was a sign of a symbol of, of the modernization going on here. And of course the, the new plans and of course the planning permits and of course all the building outside the old city, which was the, the beginning of the modernization of the city. Um, but but the British, of course, didn't see that because they had their own idea of modernization, and it was Western and it was foreign, and and it, and, and interesting, you, you know, you mentioned um, the conference that we had about a month ago, and I think it's one of the most important um, revelations that I had during that conference of um, being able to see this transition more clearly, or at least realizing that I don't know enough about that transition because. Um, the story of modern Jerusalem starts in December of 1917, and we don't really look at the transition. We know what had been lost, we know what had been um, uh, demolished in order to allow British modernization of the city, 
but I think we haven't yet enough done a, an, an this fine historical work of actually seeing this transition, which took some time, which took a few years and, and it was eventually completed only in 1967 after the, the conquest of Eastern Jerusalem. That was the final blow to the Ottoman Jerusalem, which still existed at the time. So I, I, this, is, this is one of the things that I'm most interested in now, but obviously the British did tend um, to this duality of the, his, the historical city that we want to preserve and the new city that we want to modernize. They didn't want to modernize the old city, of course, all the modernization they spoke about was outside the city walls. And they made a distinction between complete preservation or almost complete preservation of the old city and some um, green areas around it to, to complete the buffer zone. And everything which was modern was to take place away from the old city. The new city was to develop elsewhere. So McLean developed the new city in the shape of a grid, <coughs> sorry, and, and Ashby and Geddes developed the new city of zoning and garden suburbs and everything that was modern in Western planning at the time, but it was all to be removed from the old city. And you can see that clearly in, in Ashby's um, images and his beautiful drawings where if you, if you look towards the old city, you see something almost, you see biblical images of people dressed in, 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 in local traditional dress and riding donkeys. And if you just turn around and look towards the new city, the image is completely different. It's, it's almost European. So there was a clear distinction. And, and I think this is also where, um, this is where they failed because they failed to see the actual modernization of Jerusalem of the time. Of course, they failed to see the Ottoman modernization. They, they, they were almost completely blind to it, but they didn't even see the modernization of, of the newcomers to Jerusalem, of, of the Zionists. And, and that was, that was a, a, um, a cause for great dispute between Ashby and the Zionist commission. He wanted something different from the city. And, and, and the main reason that he eventually left the city was because he couldn't accommodate the modernization of the city by the Zionists of the time. It, it didn't go along with his own plan for the city. And Geddes also, he had this biblical image of Jewish Jerusalem, whereas Jewish Jerusalem was being built on completely different lines at the time. Um, one, you know, one of the great things that struck me when I started reading Geddes in Jerusalem was that how he came outside out of the train station and he oh and he looked over the old city and and we know that between the train station and the old city were all those new neighborhoods of the Jews who were leaving the walls like Mishkenot Ananim and Yemin Moshe and today we're very proud of them because they are they are the pioneering Jewish neighborhoods outside the old city this was the modernization of Jewish Jerusalem and Geddes looked at those and he said, what are those slums doing on the way from the train station to the old city? His vision of modernized, of modern Jewish Jerusalem was completely different. So there was eventually um, a misunderstanding, which, which I think was one of the reasons that eventually Aspi and Geddes failed in, in certain aspects in the work in the city. Let me mention that in 2011, you published a book called Geddes, uh, Patrick Geddes and Town Planning, published by Routledge, uh, which essentially is looking at the work of Patrick Geddes and just in general, but obviously focusing on Jerusalem. And I was wondering, and you already gave us a, a few details, but if you can give us a sense of, of, you know, sort of the man and how he came to Jerusalem and how, why probably should be the the, the the better question, why was interested in a Jewish Jerusalem? You know, what, what is that triggered this interest uh, to come to Jerusalem and focus on one aspect and not the old city, for instance? Hmm. Um, well, Geddes was, was very, very interesting, uh, really a very interesting man um, with many interests. Uh, but after I, I read quite a lot of his writings, um, I realized that he was, he had a very clear, worldview. And it was a worldview which was shared by many of his contemporaries of, of progression, of Western progression, of how different 
periods in, 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 in the shared Western history evolved and led from one another. And he viewed the biblical Jewish world as one of the basic, basic um, um, layers of Western civilization. And he, in his worldview of evolution, we have to go back to the basic traits. Each nation has to go back to its roots and evolve from there, go back to the best, to the ideal time and progress from there. So his interest in Jerusalem was not only particular because of the Jewish people. Of course, he was, you know, for, for religious reasons, he, as he says, he, he grew up on the Bible. He knew the stories well. He used to go to church and listen to the stories. So he had this uh, personal religious affiliation to, to Judaism and to the Holy Land. But it was also part of his worldview of we have to go back to the basics, just like going back to, 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 to Greek philosophy and to Roman um, success. We have to go back to the biblical era in order to progress from there. And Jerusalem was for, he, for him an, an epitome of this world philosophy. Um, no use going back to Athens or to Rome. Let's go back to Jerusalem. And that will be the beginning, not only of a new um, Jewish homecoming, but also of a new world. Going back to the basic Jewish tradition and Jewish belief and Jewish successes um, would, would make us all better, would make civilization great again. Um, and, he, and he wrote about it so much. Uh, you know, I, I recently wrote about his plans for the Hebrew University. The Hebrew University was for him not just a Hebrew University, it would be the first of a modern world um, type of university. This would be the right way to educate our children. And it would take place in Jerusalem. This would be the first of the, he, he called it an incipient university, an incipient uh, education. And it will start in Jerusalem because we have to go back to that biblical era, um, you know, once again, we say in Hebrew, uh, to go back to, to the time of the glory. And he, 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 certainly, he certainly related to that. He said, let's go back to the time of the, glory, of the glorious uh, biblical past of the Jews in their land and renew that. Let's go back and, and, and decipher the basics. What, what is this area? What, what, what was this era made of? What were the basic elements of that time? Let's reveal these, let's redeem this and evolve them to the next step. And this will not only aid the Jews, it will aid the whole world or at least Western civilization. So he worked in India, he worked in so many other places, but for him coming to Jerusalem was the best that he could ask for because this would be the place where the whole world can see the next step into better progression, into better civilization. And I really want to ask you about uh, this comparative aspect, because obviously your work also focused on the other cities, try to compare uh, urban planning. And I was wondering to what extent sort of a, maybe sh shall we call it like British imperial uh, planning or ideas came to Jerusalem, if Jerusalem was also influenced by uh, plans uh, developing other cities. Mm -hmm. Well, Jerusalem was obviously unique, but nevertheless, it was part of, of the British Empire, which is why we were lucky enough to get five planners within 30 years of British rule, which, you know, as a planner, I know that's a lot. It takes so long to, to make a plan and to improve it. And we had five different planners in 30 years and they all worked and, and they all made an impact. So obviously that was part of the influence of, of the British Empire because they could they could do it. And they had this... this um, um, their professional manpower, which was available to them. Um, and obviously there were a lot of connections and there were a lot of influences on these planners who came from various places. I mentioned McLean, who came from Khartoum. Um, Ashby worked in Cairo. Geddes obviously worked in, in India and in Cyprus uh, before that. So they all came with this um, baggage of, of colonial imperial planning. Um, they all learned, they, all, they were all affected from by the different places that they worked in. But Jerusalem was different. And it's, it, it really is very interesting to compare it to other uh, places that the British planned at the time. Um, so on one hand, it was the place for those planners to, 
to make an impact, to finally materialize their plans. But it was also different. So for example, if we compare Jerusalem to Jaffa, and there's no reason not to compare them. Jerusalem is the capital of the Judean kingdom, but it's just as ancient as Jaffa and, and just as important. And it might've been even not as important as Jaffa was when the British arrived. But in Jaffa, the British materialized their plans in full. And when they wanted to control the city, they just rebuilt it, or at least were going to rebuild it. And they were making uh, very dramatic plans and dr dramatic changes to the fabric of the city. Uh, we can compare Jerusalem to, to Acre, which is also a wonderful old city, which was also deemed for preservation by the British, but they also demolished parts of the walls in order to improve the old city. We can compare Jerusalem to cities that the British planned in India, um, as, as, as Geddes did. So the British plans in Calcutta and in Madras and in Bombay were completely different. They were all about improvement, improvement plans. Improvement means let's demolish what doesn't work. Let's change the old and the traditional and make it modern, make it new. When they came to Jerusalem, the first thing they did was say, don't touch, don't touch anything. Whatever is within the wall, let's conserve it completely. And even conserving the wall itself was, 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 was a, very different from everything else they did because walls were not needed in the world at that time, definitely not here. Um, but it's here also on one hand, we see the demolition of the walls in, in Old Delhi, the demolition of Jaffa, the demolition, partial demolition of the walls in Acre. Whereas in Jerusalem, Ashby not only preserved the walls, he rehabilitated the walls. They were falling apart after four long years of war. Their stones served as building material. People were living inside the walls and on top of them. And the first, the greatest accomplishment of Ashby was to clear the walls as much as he could and replenish them in order to make them into a promenade where people can walk over the walls and look inside the old city and make the clear distinction between the old city and the new city. And make this once again, a, on one hand, the separation between everything that's old and should be preserved and then everything that is new and should be modernized, but also to make sure that we always remember our past. We always remember where the city, how the city started and how it should be developed. Um, but everything else outside the old city was modern. Well, maybe not everything because when Geddes arrived, he said, uh, let's discard of, of McLean's grid. We have to plan the roads according to traditional roads. We have to preserve the traditional roads like Chevron Road, Gaza Street, um, uh, Damascus Road. Let's preserve them because they retain the tradition of the place. They retain the genius loci. This is the place that this, it should be developed according to the same lines. So his development was more careful. But that was also something that was um, uh, unique to Geddes. Ashby developed a, a modern city. They all wanted modernization. And of course, Geddes and Ashby were eventually replaced by um, even more um, um, practical planners, like, um, Holiday and Kendall, which envisioned a modern, completely modern city. Of course, they retained the basic elements of planning that were set by Geddes and Ashby. But their plan of the city was a completely modern plan and it can be easily compared to plans that were made at the time in London, for example. We see very similar elements, very similar even um, the graphics are similar. So of course the content of the plan is very, very similar to everything else that was happening throughout the empire at the time. Quite interestingly, individuals like Ashby and Geddes were essentially connected uh, almost directly with the Zionist movement. In fact, they were even paid um, by the Zionist organization. I was wondering if there's any sort of a room or space in their plans for the other side of the population, the Palestinians, the Arabs. How do they envision uh, the non-Jewish population of Jerusalem within the larger uh, picture of the city and their plans? So once again, there is a great distinction here between Ashby and Geddes. Ashby was, we could say today, pro-Palestinian. 
he regarded the local Palestinian population as the true, um, the true people of the place because they grew in this place, they developed it. They were the ones whose architecture was still present in the city. They represented the old traditions. All the, all the local traditions were obviously local. They were not Jewish. We spoke about Jewish art. There was no such thing at the time, which is why he also revived local arts, local crafts. And he was very much for the development and this is uh, the uh, and sustaining the local population. He even chose to live in Vadi Jos, which is today part of East Jerusalem. And as I mentioned before, the reason he left was because the the Jewish modern modern plans um, brought in a new sewage system, which uh, which um, eventually um, uh, emptied into Vadi Jos, which is which is a, a valley. And it was a local Palestinian neighborhood, and he he couldn't he couldn't um, bring together the the modern the modernization of, of of the Jewish neighborhoods and the Zionist Commission doing what almost what it wanted in the city, and the fact that the the, the local Palestinians were being kept being left behind because they didn't have the same impetus, the same power. Obviously, this is the same finance. Um, for Geddes, it was a little bit different. Um, but I think he really, because he uh, inclined towards the Jewish population, he didn't see the local Palestinian population in the same light. And I think that's one of the reasons that he allowed himself to, to make such dramatic plans, to suggest just dramatic plans in, in the Western Wall area, because he thought, not because he, he looked down on the local population, but because he really thought this was the, the way to evolutionized to, to bring forth the next step of development of the area. Before talking about uh, archives and digitizing archives, I want to ask you something in, in relation to the legacy of uh, you know, plans made by Ashby and, and Geddes. If we were taking a walk now in Jerusalem, would we be able to experience any legacy left by Ashby and uh, Geddes in their plannings and, you know, also obviously particularly related to Ashby, certainly there is this question of uh, arts, uh, which may be visible through the sort of sponsorship uh, of uh, uh, ceramics and so forth. But if we were just walking around Jerusalem, would we be able to see something left by uh, these two individuals? Frankly, yes, there is so much left behind um, from both of them. Um, Let's start again with the old city. It was Ashby's park system around the old city, which eventually materialized in, in 1967. Ashby drew this beautiful plan of, of, of surrounding the old city with a park system, with simply parks. With He wanted to clear the walls of all the encroachments, as he called them, all those buildings which were built on top of those ancient walls. It had They had to be cleared. They had to be visible. And in order to make them visible, he wanted to surround the old city with a, with a park system, with, with a series of parks, which would, in Storr's words, uh, um, old, he called it uh, grass and cypresses. This is how he envisioned the, the local landscape. Um, and, and he said, this is what it looked like in the times of, of, of David and Solomon. Again, they kept going back to that biblical imagine, imagination. And, and Ashby had the tools for that. Ashby created the park system around the old city. And he said, we have to clear the walls. We have to, to plant grass around the city in order to preserve it and in order to, to make it visible from afar. Uh, the British didn't have enough time or enough money to do that when they were ruling over, over Jerusalem. But interestingly enough, in 1967, when the city was reunited, as we say, uh, and, and Israeli authorities took over the old city, it seemed as if they found Ashby's plans in a drawer and they said, wow, it's amazing. This is exactly what we want for the city. And, and it's very interesting because um, I looked into the planning of Jerusalem in the time of its separation between 1948 and 1967, and, and we had no intentions of, of of, of beautifying the old city as the British did. But in 1967, when we became 
um, the landowners or um, the guardians of the old city, all of a sudden the British logic became um, the right thing to do. It was so obvious that this is what we have to do as well. And we came up with a very similar park system. And we call it, of course, the national park and, and, and the whole area of the old city is now surrounded by park. It took some years to, to eventualize. The last part was, um, um, was created, I think about five or six years ago. It's the Teddy Park, which is just outside of Jaffa Gate. But the whole of the old city is surrounded by a national park, which was created in 1967. It's a beautiful park. Uh, the landscape arch architect did a wonderful job of making it look natural. It looks as if this is really what it looked like during David's time. You can imagine David walking on the grass in Jaffa Gate as if there was a Jaffa Gate in his time, because it looks so natural. It looks like the right thing. The, the, the beautiful greenery and, and the combination of, of the walls, which is were cleaned, of course, and the greenery looks so natural. It looks like this is what it's meant to be like. And this is Ashby. This is Ashby's vision. You can almost, you know, look from look at it. You know, you can walk around with the plants and and actually see what he imagined. And of course, the the, um, the promenade of of the walls. That's Ashby. Uh, I always say that to my students, and it's always interesting because you know when you speak about the British Mandate, that's like a different century. It's so long ago. But I say, you see, the reason that we can actually walk along these walls and, and be safe and see and, 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 and encircle the whole of the old city, that's because of Ashby. It was his vision to be able to, to view the city. The view was very, very important. And, and that's obviously only the, the obvious, the, the clear uh, visions. And, and you, can really look, you can really look at Ashby's um, beautiful drawings and, and compare them. And, it's funny, you know, I mentioned when we just started talking that I, I used to live in the old city, but my school was in the German colony. And I used to walk every day from the German colony to the Jewish quarter. And when I grew up and I found Ashby's plans, I said, wow, this is, this is like my, this is my hometown. This is my childhood scenery. And, and it's, it, it was all planned by Ashby. And of course we can talk about the garden, the, the garden suburbs which were planned at least in part by Geddes and the road system, which is still Geddes. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a town planner. I know a little bit about the ring roads. Uh, some of the ring roads were built during the British period, but some, of the, some, some parts of the ring roads were built in the 1990s when I was already a young planner. And I remember, you know, the people of Jerusalem protesting. You never said there was going to be a road here in our backyard. But then, you know, they took out Gettys plans and they said, if you had only looked in the right place, you would have seen the plan, which was eventually materialized. And today we are completing the Eastern Ring Road, the Eastern part of the Ring Road, which is politically, I think a very, very problematic section. And maybe that's the reason that, that they weren't built until now. On, on planning level, it makes complete sense. If you want to encircle the city and, it, and it's a concentric city, it's all around the old city. You want to encircle it. If you want to make a full circle, and that's the great advantage of a ring road that you can encircle the city, you have to complete the Eastern part of it. And that was only materialized, I think last year. Um, that, you know, that's a, a, different, a different kind of talk, but it, it's, it's Getty's plan, which was made when the local politics was still a little bit more simple than it is today. The city wasn't as big. It wasn't as complex. It wasn't as, you know, the people weren't as, it, it wasn't as difficult as it is today to envision a road that encircles Jerusalem from west to east. But it was always the planner's view that if, if we want to progress, if we, we spoke about the, the tram, so we have a light railway. If we want to have a light railway in the center of the city, we have to drive all the vehicles to the outskirts of the city. And in order to do that, we need a ring road. So we keep going back to get these plans, which were very, very logical. And the logic works until today, when of course the geography is completely different, but it's the same logical planning which still works. And I can speak about arts and crafts in Jerusalem. I don't think we still relate that to Ashby, but there are so many places along the walls which are called arts and crafts. 
And we have a, a yearly summer festival of arts and crafts in Jerusalem. And the most prominent local arts and crafts are blown glass and, ceram and Armenian ceramics. Obviously, we don't think of Ashby when we go to that fair, but there is so much of his ideology and, and his romantic notion of the city, which still lives here today. Going back to Ashby and Geddes, it means to obviously dig into the archives. And uh, for the last bit of this interview, I really want to bring you to uh, uh, this conference that you organized at Beth Salel uh, about essentially digitizing the archives of Jerusalem. And I was wondering if you can give us a sense of uh, the archival situation at the moment in Jerusalem. If we wanna look into urban planning, for instance, where do we find the material? What are the obstacles and issues related to historical research into uh, this specific field? So if you want to learn about the planning of the city, obviously you have to go into the historical archives of Jerusalem municipality. That's on, on a professional level, that's where those records should be kept. Uh, there is a continuous planning in Jerusalem, at least since 1918, or if you want to be more exact, since 1921, where their planning commissions were, uh, were became official, and they're all kept in the historical archives. Um, and there is a lot of material kept because you know there were five planners who did a lot of work. There were three different committees, which were eventually responsible for Jerusalem, the local committee, the district uh, planning committee, and eventually the central planning committee uh, commission. And they were all working very hard because Jerusalem was really developing at the time. There's so many new neighborhoods being built and so many building permits uh, given out. There was really a lot of work of planning and everything is eventually was eventually deposited at the municipality. Um, unfortunately, it's not very accessible for various reasons. Um, first of all, because I think the historical archives of the municipality are not so much aware of, uh, of what they have and of the importance of, of their treasures, of their archival history. Um, so on, on a very technical level, it's very hard to access the archives because they're only open nine hours a week and you have to announce that you're coming, you have to reserve a spot. So it's very, very difficult. And, and on a more uh, benign technical um, issue, those um, collections are not cataloged. So even if you can access and you do get a spot, it's very hard to reach those documents because you wouldn't be able to find them in the catalog. You wouldn't be able to know what you're looking for. And, and you know, as part of the uh, of part, as part of the work that we're doing now in the archives project in Betzalel, we we um, made our, our own research of those plans, and we made our own basic cataloging, our own registry of those plans. And one of the fascinating things that we discovered was that the British, of course, they were um, very meticulous in their work and they wrote everything that they held. Uh, but the interesting thing is that every, um, um, civil, um, every municipal engineer and every, every, every time the, the, the people who were in charge of the planning system in Jerusalem changed, the records changed. The way they wrote down the records changed. So you actually have to go through the, the records that the British made in order to reach that material. Of course, it's not unified, it's not the same, it's, it's changed. And there isn't a, a, a new registry. There is no modern Israeli catalog of, of those records. So for various reasons, it's difficult to reach that documentation. Um, and, and of course, you know, plans are being dispersed and plans are being shifted from place to place. Sometimes they're needed in a different department and some of the boxes move. And obviously some of the papers are missing by now. And every time the municipality had to move, we lost a few boxes or at least a few files. So basically the planning material of British Jerusalem is all kept in the historical archives of Jerusalem municipality but it's, it's not so easy to access and to study them as a whole. 
And, and obviously that was one of the reasons that we embarked on our project in order to, um, to digitize them in the very basic way, just to make them available, to make them accessible in, in any other way. Online, of course, is, is, seems to be the, the simplest solution. Of course it is not, but you know, just digitizing those documents and putting them online would expose them to the public, to professionals, to people who work in planning Jerusalem, to people who work in conserving Jerusalem. You know, I keep saying, because I'm a planner, I keep saying, you cannot work as a planner in Jerusalem without knowing the, the, the original planning, because it wasn't that long ago, it's just a hundred years. And Jerusalem has grown so much, but it still grows according to the lines that the British set. So in order to make any future plan for Jerusalem, you have to know how it all started and that's all kept back in the archives. Of course, I'm not just a planner, I'm also a historian and I believe that in order to do a good job, we have to know the history. But even, you know, I mentioned the ring road, the original plan for the ring road is kept in the archives. And, and if you want to do it properly, or at least you want to follow the logic of the development of Jerusalem over the last century, you have to go back to those documents. Well, the same was for the original plan of a tram line, which essentially yeah. would have followed more or less the same uh, path. Obviously, now it's more politicized and problematic because yeah. it follows uh, the green line. But certainly under the Ottomans, you, you know, the, the idea was to connect communities which were already alongside that kind of line. And uh, yeah. uh, again, it's important to look back. But I was wondering maybe briefly, uh, and I'm asking this question because I too experienced the uh, municipal archives and I often had this feeling that there was a degree of neglect, uh, not understanding exactly what uh, is available. And on the other hand of a conscious political choice, not necessarily to make it easy to keep uh, aspects of the history of a city, some sort of a, in a box and not an easy one to find. And I was wondering mm -hmm. what is your feeling about uh, the, the, the situation of the um, Jerusalem Municipal Archives. Yeah. It's an interesting issue because we keep saying in, in, in Israel, and it's a sad joke that the archive had been burnt. You know, if you look for archives in, in, in what the British called mixed cities like Lod, Lida or Ramle, the, the archive was, a, you know, Jaffa. Jaffa archive had been burnt. Of course, it, it's hard to accept and we keep looking for them. So in Jerusalem, the archive wasn't burnt. Um, and I don't know how, how political this issue is. I really don't believe that the people who are responsible for the archive today are hiding its history. I, I really believe that they're just not aware of its importance. Um, you know, there is a lot of Ottoman material in, in, the, municip in the municipality archives, um, which only recently we've realized it, of, of its importance because we only recently I realized that there was a lot of planning and there was a lot of municipal work going on even before the British arrived. So now we, we want to read those materials. So the, the, then there was the obstacle of the language. We couldn't read those uh, documents because they were written in a, in, a lang in, a, in a script that wasn't legible to researchers today, but nevertheless, they're there. So you have the people who are in charge of them and have no way of cataloging them because they can't even know for themselves what's in there. Um, so I, I really believe it's more of a, of, a, of a technical neglect than a political neglect, or at least I would believe that. You know, I was recently, um, because I have this interest, this practical and, and academic interest in the British planning collection, and, and I keep trying to get my hands on the documents you know, I have the capacity of cataloging them and scanning them because they have this because I have this project, so I, I can do it. And I am I still try to convince the municipality that you know I have no harmful intentions. I will not sell them to anyone, and I will not expose them. You know, in a way that's that's illegal. That's also an issue. I mean, they, they think that exposing documents might be dangerous in a way, which is you know for me as a historian, it's something that I I, I can't understand, but. I was recently in, in, um, in a meeting once again about this issue, trying to once again persuade them to let me digitize those documents for the benefit of, of everyone. And, and, and they just recently realized that they have a lot more um, documents than they thought. 
uh, there is about 7,000 containers, 7,000 containers uh, within the historical archives. And because they are looking into the material now, because there, there, there needs to be a revision in the historical archives, they just recently realized that there is a, a total of over 100,000 boxes in total of some kind of historical material. And only 7,000 is kept on the premises and is accessible to researchers. So even if you made it to the historical archives and you got a spot and you knew what you were looking for, what is the chance that it would be in those 7,000 boxes that are kept there? Um, so I really want to believe that it's just um, a lack of, of, of attention and just really an, um, a misinterpretation of the importance of things. And maybe what they, they, keep, they keep saying, we don't have enough manpower, we don't have the budget is not big enough. I want to believe that at least in Jerusalem, it's not so much a political issue. Um, I want to be optimistic. I want to, you know, I want to believe that we can overcome these technical issues, and 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 I want to believe that, you know, through accessing them and cataloging them and digitizing them, we'll be able to access them and learn from them. I really want to believe that there is nothing, you know, beyond that. But of course, I might be naive or too optimistic. Well, I myself still don't know what's in in there. Future will tell. But there is yeah. one thing I want to ask you that came out of this conference. Um, you know, like yourself and others often talked about the question of digital heritage, uh, which is another buzzing word that I heard from uh, several guests. And I was wondering, what do you mean by digital heritage and what is digital heritage in the context of Jerusalem? Um, you know, I can go at it from, from, from several points. The, the very basic thing is making um, heritage in terms of the documents digital uh, means making them accessible allowing everyone to reach those documents and read them for themselves, you know, overlooking um, barriers of language or script. But the, in this aspect, digitizing heritage is, is modern, is, um, is democ democratizing heritage, is to make heritage available for everyone. Because, you know, as a historian, I'm very much aware of the problematic of someone telling you history. You know, we mentioned the uh, Yoshua ben Oyeh beforehand. This was the history of Jerusalem. And slowly today, we're, we're more and more aware of the fact that history is, is very selective. And if we want to know more about the history of the city, we should be able to reach the historical documents ourselves and make and, and, and tell the story of the heritage of the city, narrate the heritage on our own. So this, of course, it's a very, it's a very, you know, idealistic notion. But in in this aspect, digitizing heritage, and that's the aspect that I think is the most important, is making it democratic, allowing everyone to be to, to reach the documents on their own. Not only the British planning collection, which is important and interesting for me, but also reaching Ottoman papers, which preceded them, and allowing everyone to make the story of their own Jerusalem, um, to be able to read those documents, not only uh, you know, because we want to know how the city was planned and developed, but we want to allow everyone to relate to the piece of history which is relevant to them, which is relevant to their community, relevant to their neighborhood, relevant to their part of the city, and, and not have to wait for, for a researcher or a historian to be able to go into the archive and, and tell the story according to his own perspective. Um, so for me, that's the most important part of digitizing heritage. Uh, but of course, it's not only that, you know, if we speak about heritage and not only documents, if we speak about conservation in the city, um, how do we choose what to conserve? How do we justify our selection? How do we justify our decision? How do we, you know, in, in, in the most practical level, how do we go to the um, conservation committee and persuade them that the building should be conserved? How do we put it out there and, and, and guard it? Um, so digitizing heritage also makes knowledge not only more democratic, but also more available, or at least more uh, coherent. 
And, and one of the things that we want to do in our project is to use digital technology in order to make more information available online. And the very basic way to do it is by using the GIS, the Geographical Information System of the municipality itself. The Geographical Information System holds so much information about the city in terms of um, communities and transportation, lighting in the city, um, sewage, planning, so much information is available, but there isn't enough, there is hardly any, especially in Jerusalem, information regarding historical layers. And, and, and one of the main things that we want to do and we want to accomplish in this project is to, to make conservation or to make the history of the city more, vis more visible and more accessible digitally by creating what we call temporarily, um, we call it um, heritage layer. We want to create another layer of geographical information, which relates to heritage. Um, I don't know how heritage sounds in English. In, in Hebrew, it has a very strong uh, political sense because when we say heritage, heritage in Hebrew, it, it's quite clear whose heritage uh, we want to preserve and we want to tell the story of. So that relates to the part of the democratizing heritage, but even making it digital and making it neutral, because when you see it on a map, it's neutral. And, and, and all the buildings are of the same importance because they're laid out there on a geographical system. They're out there on the map. So all the buildings of a historical, um, um, of a historical importance have similar importance. So what we want to do is create this layer of information which relates to history, which will make conservation more professional, uh, more accessible, and, and, and maybe easier. Because you know we keep saying preservation in Jerusalem, it's, it's nothing but simple, it's nothing but easy. But maybe by digitizing the information which relates to it, which feeds into the system, will make it a little bit easier. I guess we can safely say that everything in Jerusalem becomes more complicated than it should be. I have one last question. Our interview, our discussion followed a couple of uh, directions, but I was wondering if there's anything that I didn't ask, whether in relation to urban planning or digitizing archives that you want to talk about and you know, spend the next few minutes. Hmm. Oh, well, thank you for that. Well, maybe I'll go back to the fact that I live here. Um, I live in a, in a beautiful neighborhood called Baka. Uh, it, it was built by um, local Palestinians who, were, um, who owned this land as agricultural land, and they eventually built their own houses. And as a town planner, I can tell you there was no plan for Baka. People just build their houses, uh, which means that the road system is, is very intimate. Uh, today we love it. It means that there are no, there were no public buildings in Baca, not even a mosque or a church, because everyone built for themselves. Um, and and next and and the next neighborhood is Talpiot, which we, which is a Jewish garden suburb, uh, planned first by Geddes and then by the ultimate Zionist planner Richard Kaufman, inhabited by Jews. So at some point, the Arabs living in Baca and the Jews living in Talpiot were neighbors. And there was a Hebron road, the Hebron separating them. And you know, just a few hundred meters from here is the first Ottoman railway, which reached Jerusalem at the end of the 19th century, which was you know, a clear sign of modernization. And, and, and for me, because this is my work, um, for me, this is very, um, very clear. And when I walk down the street, I, it's inevitable for me to think of the people who used to live here before. And it's inevitable for me to think of the original context of, of when these neighborhoods were built. And, and I think it, and I think it's, this is, you know, one of my missions as in my, my personal academic mission to make this context um, clearer to more people, to make, to, to help people understand the geography of, of the place they live. Uh, because this is such a complex city, but it doesn't have to be complex on the, on the negative side. It's, it's a beautiful city because of the people who built it, because of the various 
um, influences that, that um, made the city because of the different individuals who created the city. And, and, and I think that if we're a little bit more aware of the way that the city was built over time, we will have maybe a little bit more respect to the city and especially to the people. Um, so, you know, I'm lucky enough to have uh, different students in Betel El of different neighborhoods in the city, of places from outside the city. And, and, and it's my mission in this case as, as a teacher to open their eyes. You know, geography sounds boring, but geography is, is, is the space that we inhabit. And I think that we're, if we're a little bit more aware of how this space came into being and how it was influenced by the people who lived here over time um, and, and how it was influenced by different disciplines and different trends, then maybe we'll have a little bit more respect to the different layers of the actual city and its building, and, and, and most importantly, to the people who live here today and who have lived here in the past and are long, no longer here. This was Noah Heisler Rubin, senior lecturer at Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem. Noah, thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. This was fascinating. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, Please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.